Today we're going to be looking at how you know how to write the chemical formula for a compound if you're given its name. There's one set of rules for ionic compounds and one set of rules for covalent compounds. So that's the first decision you have to make is to decide what type of compound is it. So an easy way to tell if something is an ionic compound versus a covalent, the ionic ones are always going to be made up of a combination of metals with nonmetals, whereas the covalent ones are typically nonmetals only. Occasionally, you might get a metalloid to sneak in there, but almost all covalent compounds are made up of nonmetals only. So we're going to focus for just a little bit on rules for ionic compounds, and then we'll come back in a few minutes and focus on the covalent ones. So first off, for those ionic compounds made up of metals with nonmetals, the metal portion is always the first part of the name. So you would just write the symbol of the metal. So um, if you saw the word silver, you'd write down the symbol AG, or if you saw the word aluminum, you'd write down the symbol AL. Just whatever it says, you write the symbol for. The second step is to figure out what the charge of that metal would be. And it tells you there if it's from groups 1A, 2A, or 3A, it would have a charge of plus one, plus two, or plus three. So what do they mean by that? Well, if you look at your periodic table, we learned in our periodic table chapter that the uh, alkali metals here, that all of these guys would tend to lose one electron to be stable, to have the same number of valence electrons as those noble gases do. So lithium, for example, would lose one electron to go from three down to two to mimic helium. Or potassium has 19 electrons. If it loses one, it would go down to 18 to be like argon. So that whole column, all those elements in that column, would lose one electron when it becomes an ion, so a plus one charge. Uh, if we looked at the next column over, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, all these guys, they have two electrons too many compared to the noble gases, so they would lose two. So these guys all form plus two charges, and then if you're from the third column over here, you would be plus well, what if the metal isn't from groups 1A, 2A, or 3A? Um, if it's a transition metal, one of those guys in the D block on the periodic table, um, there'll be an additional piece of information. It'll have a Roman numeral in addition to the word. So rather than just saying aluminum, um, where that, that's from the family that the plus three charge. If you had something like iron, iron is a transition metal in the middle of the periodic table, right here. And so we don't know what its charge is just by looking at the periodic table. So how are we gonna figure out what its charge would be? In that case, you'll also have a Roman numeral that will tell you what the charge is. The next part is writing the symbol for the nonmetal. If the name ends in the letters I, D, E, it's generally one type of element. Write the symbol for whatever nonmetal it kind of sounds like. So if you heard the word chloride, that kind of sounds like chlorine, so you'd write that symbol down. Or if you heard oxide, that kind of sounds like oxygen, so you'd write that symbol down. If the name ends in eight or eight, it's a polyatomic ion, a group of atoms with a charge, and it tells you to look it up on your charge sheet. The charge sheet that it's talking about is the second page of your periodic table. So there's the periodic table. You look on, um, if you have a hard copy, this is what's on the back side, or the electronic copy, it's page two. Um, any of these where there's a group of elements with a charge, so something like these guys, um, that acetate, for example, 
is two carbons, three hydrogens, two oxygens, and then that minus up there tells you that it's a negative one charge. That whole group has a negative one charge. Or chromate down here is one chromium, four oxygens, and the combination of all those put together has a negative two charge. If you notice the endings here, eight, 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 right? All of these guys, for the most part, have endings of eight or eight. We'd need to figure out what the charge of the nonmetal is. Well, if it's from the 5A, 6A, or 7A family, it has charges of negative three, negative two, negative one. That comes from when we did our periodic table chapter, once again, that if we looked at this side over here, our halogen family all needs to gain one electron to be stable. So upon gaining an electron, when it becomes an ion, it would have one extra negative one. If you are in this family right here, the oxygen family, oh, let me just change it up just a little bit, these guys. There's our nonmetals there, that those guys tend to form negative two charges. They gain two electrons. Uh, nitrogen and phosphorus right here. These guys, these nonmetals, tend to gain three electrons. Like nitrogen, the atom, has three electrons, or excuse me, has seven electrons. It would like to have ten like neon, so it needs to gain three extra electrons to do so. The neutral atom is called nitrogen. The ion is called nitride, or the neutral atom is called oxygen, but the ion form is called oxide. The last step, after you know what the ions are that are combining and you know what the charges are, you have to balance those charges to make sure that the total positive equals the total negative. Let's see how this works with a few examples.